I'm Chris Armstrong. I'm going to be talking about doing purely functional programming at your day job, um, especially with uh, side effects. Um, so I assume a lot of people, or some people in here, uh, enjoy functional programming. Um, but few of us in the kind of greater industry are able to use it at work. Um, a lot of us use imperative languages like Python, Ruby, Java. Um, and even fewer of us uh, use like pure, pure functional programming, like with tracked effects. I'm going to get into that in a second. Um, so who here does use like only imperative languages at work? OK, yeah, like most, like 90% at least. Um, I use Python at work. Uh, Rackspace does almost everything in Python, especially in the cloud stuff. Um, but it didn't stop me from doing functional programming. Uh, it shouldn't stop you. Like Everybody can do it. Any language is, is capable of do it, doing it. And it's not that hard. Um, especially because there are a lot of libraries available for um, popular languages. Um, so uh, at Py in Python, I personally use tool Toolsy and Persistent a lot. Toolsy is kind of general purpose, um, you know, higher order functions, uh, kind of neat utilities for iterators and stuff like that, um, all purely functional. And Persistent is uh, an implementation of um, array tree based data structures like the closures data structures for Python. It's pretty performant. Um, Ruby has similar things like functional Ruby and Hamster, uh, respectively similar. Um, JavaScript has like 15 different things, of course, that all try to do the same thing with slight variations. Um, uh, the functional.js library actually differentiates itself, di differentiates itself from underscore uh, in argument order, <laughs> which is it's kind of relevant if you're doing currying, but you know it's it's pretty minor. Uh, there's also languages like ClojureScript, Elm, and PureScript, which compile to JavaScript, which are really neat. Java has functional Java. I haven't like looked at it too closely, but it looks kind of neat. And of course, the the languages, the functional languages that compile to uh, to Java, like Clojure and Scala. Um, all of these give you a nice kind of standard library for functional programming and give give you nice immutable data structures that are performant. Um, but in most of these things, other than like Elm and PureScript, I think, um, implicit effects are still really common. Like you just, when you're, when you're writing something to the internet, you just do it. Like, and it's in the middle of a function, right? And you, you, it's not tracked anywhere. Um, even like, yeah, so like if you're an OCaml programmer, Scala, Racket, like it all works like that. Um, so for the rest of this talk, I'll refer to implicit side effects as YOLO. It's a transitive verb. It means it's what you do to global state or external interfaces when you have an implicit side effect. Um, for example, uh, this function YOLO is an accumulator every time it's called. And Java's URL objects YOLO the internet when you try to compare them for equality? What? So how do we deal with these side effects without doing a YOLO? Uh, first, we try not to have them. Like A lot of times, you can just refactor stuff um, so that uh, you don't actually have side effects. You just use a better factoring functional data structures. Like the first example, you, you, know, you can accumulate things by returning uh, a, like a, a, a bigger list or something every time. Um, but you know, some, of, some side effects are, are actually necessary. A lot of side effects. Uh, any kind of internet communication, um, displaying things to the screen, reading input, sharing state between threads, all of these are intrinsically side effectful. Um, so the way we deal with this is by reifying them as values. In other words, we make them first class objects in our system. Um, and this is uh, exactly how Haskell's uh, IO types work. Um, they're, they're objects that represent um, you know, an effect. And so for example, the print function in Haskell, it doesn't actually print anything. It returns a value that, that shows the intent, that, that, that uh, represents the intent to print. Um, and once you return this value from, from the main function in your Haskell program, uh, the Haskell runtime performs it. Um, so why would you actually want to do this? Um, well, uh, in some sense, this makes your code more modular. It, it makes it purely functional. And that has all the attended benefits of, of purely functional code. Um, you can kind of reason about it with equation, equational reasoning. Um, you can compose and, and uh, you know, refactor your code a, a little bit more uh, reasonably, um, but specifically the, the, the thing I care about a lot is testing. Um, I, I really like unit testing. I'm, I'm a Python programmer, so I'm like one of those people who's like really into unit testing. And even when I come to the, to the type world, I'm like, all right, I need to figure out how to, you know, 
do this. So even in Haskell, I kind of want to I kind of want to do this. Um, and also, I hate mocks. I assume other people hate mocks. I'm just going to assume that. Um, especially if you use Python, the mock API is really bad in Python, and I just don't want to do that. I don't want to touch it. So you know, I want to I want a better way. And this is how I kind of uh, approach this problem. Um, so I'm going to show how I implemented tracked effects in Python. There's a library I wrote called Effect, and uh, I'm going I'm to show how I implemented it. So you know, I, 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 not everybody here uses Python. You use other languages. You'll be able to go home and or go, go back to your job or whatever and, and work on a library like this for whatever language you use. And I'd love to see more, more things like this. Um, some languages are going to be better than others at giving it a nice syntax. Um, but you know, usually, if you don't, even if you don't have the syntax, it can be, it can be pretty useful. Um, and I, as a bonus, I also kind of implemented this idea of a testable effect in Haskell. Um, and uh, because Haskell's IO types aren't actually testable. Like, they're, they're a nice reified representation of an effect, but you can't introspect them. You can't look at them. All you can do is perform them. Um, so uh, yeah, I wanted to come up with, I wanted to use the same nifty API that I, that I implemented for, for my system in Haskell. I'll get to that later, and any Haskellers can make fun of my code because I'm, I'm a noob. Um, so OK, let's get to some code. Here's a, a YOLO function in Python. Uh, it asks you for a name. It prints out a greeting, asks you for another name, prints out another greeting, and uh, returns a two-tuple of those things. Um, so yeah, how do, we, how do we test this typically in Python? Ugh, like that. Um, I pasted this code on my slide, and I didn't even want to fix it because like, it's too much. I don't want to go over it all. This is the mock module. Basically, what we're doing is we're monkey patching. We're replacing at runtime the raw input and print functions. Um, and uh, then we do a bunch of garbage to make sure that they like uh, return the right simulated values and expect the right arguments and all that stuff. And it's just a mess. Um, so what we actually, what I want to say is, th th like, what I want to, how I want to formulate my test is uh, there should be a sequence of expected effects that are performed in a specific order. Um, and then I want to check the final result of, of the function, the greet function. Um, the funny thing is that last slide didn't even uh, implement, it, like, ensuring that the order was right, because in the mock module, that's even harder. It's like, it's a mess. Um, so it's important that if we change the, the order of effects in our, in our code, that the test should fail, because it can be really important. Uh, order order is, is matters big time. Um, so yeah, uh, it's kind of getting to the point of my talk, which is that you know, your side effects need to be tested as much as the return function, uh, as the return value of your functions. Um, you, know, you might break something. Like, for example, if, you have, if, we, if we asked for those two names, in different, if we like, asked for both names up front, and then printed both uh, greetings, like that would be a, a, a significant difference in our behavior in the, of, of the function. Like it's not something that you want to accidentally refactor and then allow that to happen, um, you know, unless you intended to do it. And so that you want your test to, to be careful of that. Another example is like if you have multiple locks, you know, it's really important to lock locks, in, acquire locks in the same order everywhere, and you want to like make sure that you're testing it, um, testing that it's doing doing things in the right order. Uh, and so, yeah, like by definition, a side effect is something that's observable. And when something is observable, you want it, you want to consider it at least when you're defining your contract with your end users. And you also want to test anything that is in your contract with your end users. So, yeah. Um, I, I like to think of side effects kind of as a log. Um, whenever I run a function and it has side effects, I want to think about exactly like, you know, a nice representation of the side effects um, that happened. Uh, as kind of a sequence or a, or a log. Um, and that's kind of how the effect libraries testing API works, but I'll, I'll show you that in a bit. Um, so here I'm going to, this is me porting the, the YOLO code to an effect, uh, to, to my effect library. Um, I use this decorator called do, um, and it kind of, it assumes that your function is going to be a generator function, which is what that yield syntax is. Um, and it kind of iterates your, your generator, your, your function, um, with a with some special behavior, so um, the prompt functions, the prompt and display functions are like raw input and print. Um, uh, they re but they return effects, and so when you yield an effect inside of a do function, um, that's basically saying, hey, resume me, resume this function when the result of this effect is available, 
right? And uh, so then it'll go on to the yield display, and then you know, and so on. Um, at the end, we have a yield do return thing, which is kind of just some like janky syntax that works around some limitations in Python 2. In Python 3, you can just say return statement as normal. Um, the last important thing to know is that the do decorator makes your function return an effect. So not only is it giving you a way to deal with effects inside of the function, it makes you, you know, your, your function return an effect. So um, I'm gonna show you how this translates to the lower level version, which should clarify it a bit. Um, yeah, that's cut off. <laughs> uh, anyone who's seen Haskell um, code, like the do notation being desugared to uh, the kind of bind in Lambda, it, like this should look very similar. It's like a staircase um, where uh, basically, so each, each effect object has an on method, which is very similar to monad, uh, monad's bind. Um, you give it a function and it returns you a new effect. Um, it's a little bit different from bind because it, it has some special error handling stuff um, and, and some other stuff, but that's not really that important. Um, so, yeah, you don't have to like understand this too much um, unless you do want to implement something like it, but I'm going to show you the effect class itself um, and how, how effects are actually represented. Um, this is uh, almost exactly the definition that I use in, in my effect library of, of effect. It's really simple, obviously. Um, all it is, is it's an, an effect is an object with an intent and some callbacks. Um, it could even be simpler, but as an optimization, I make callbacks a list instead of just having a single callback. Um, it's just a performance thing. But, you know, so the interesting thing here is, well, what's an intent? Um, well, it's, it's whatever you want it to be. Um, it's, uh, it, it can literally be any object. Um, it, it, the core effect library doesn't care. I encourage you to make it an immutable object um, with a, and a kind of a transparent data structure with public attributes. Um, so it's nicely introspectable and stuff. And it should also support equality, um, mostly to enable the testing API, which, we'll get, which I'll, I'll get to later. So I'll show you what uh, some of the intents are that I defined in, in my library. Um, so here uh, are display and prompt. Like these are the objects that those, those functions were returning. Um, uh, I'm using a library called Atras here just to make it kind of more terse. Like really all that's saying is, um, you know, display as a class, and it takes an output argument and it assigns it to the output attribute. Um, so it's just a like nice utility uh, library. Uh, it gives you equality, hashing, all that kind of stuff that you want on your objects, on your immutable objects in Python. Um, prompt uh, is similar. So uh, the important thing to note here is that there's no behavior on these on these classes. There's nothing that's like here's how you display something or here's how you prompt. It's just like it's just representing the intent to do these things. Um, and that's, that's pretty import, important. So let's think about what like this effectful greet function, right? So now that we know what we know, we know that this function doesn't do anything. It just returns an effect, and that effect doesn't know how to like, perform itself or anything like that. Um, and this is an important part of effects design. Um, there's a forced separation between intent and performance, right? Um, it makes your code more modular, so you know we could have different implementations of performers for prompt and display, like that either use standard I/O or use like some GUI thing or whatever. Um, it also, you know, it, another example would be like uh, if you have like an HTTP request intent, um, you might want to have like a blocking implementation of it that that uses like the request library in Python, or you might want to use something like Twisted, and your application code doesn't need to care what the back end is. Um, so this is, this is a nice way to kind of normalize that and, and ab abstract away kind of like nitty gritty side effect details. Um, so I'm going to show you how to actually perform something like this if you're writing a program and you want to write the main function. Um, so it's, it's not that interesting. Uh, you can do this in different ways. This is the way I did it in the effect library just to like maximize modularity and usability and stuff. Um, but so basically there's this dispatcher system. A dispatcher is an object that when given an, you give it an intent and it returns a performer. Um, so it's pretty simpler. You, usually it looks up the, the performer to use by type. Um, so I'm going to show you, uh, so this is uh, a performer for the display intent, right? And this is where we actually do the yellow. Like this is where we um, call the print, the built-in print function, which has an implicit side effect, right? And we're going to have to test this the old-fashioned way. Like this is, you know, we need to do mocking or whatever, patching, uh, but we only have to do that once for this performer function. Right, like all the rest of our application code is abstract. It's 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 like 
first class effects, and we can use the nicer testing APIs for that. Um, so and here's, here's how we construct a dispatcher. Uh, it's, uh, I'm using type dispatcher, and it's just saying whenever you get a display intent, um, run this perform display function. Um, it's pretty simple. Uh, and finally, once we have the dispatcher and the effect, um, we call this sync perform function, uh, which takes the dispatcher and the effect, and it basically interprets the effect. It walks through the effect. It says, OK, what's the intent on this? I'm going to look, look up the performer for it and run it, and then call all the callbacks on that uh, effect. And then if they return more effects, I'm going to kind of recurse and, and go through that. So it's, it's just it's the core thing that you want to run in your, in your main function of your program. Um, you know, I, the ideal effect-based program only has one call to sync perform, and it's in your main function. But uh, you know, if you're integrating this into an, into an existing code base, you want to do it gradually. You can use sync perform. You sprinkle it throughout your code base wherever you want to introduce some more pure code, you know, and then you just use sync perform to kind of turn it into a YOLO. <clears throat> okay, so I've been talking about, I've been like dropping references to the testing API for a while. Um, I'm going to actually show you how it works. Uh, you know, originally, uh, I was writing code. I didn't have like a nicer test API, but I was just using everything that I had and everything that I showed you to do tests. So I would just write a custom performer and you know register it with the dispatcher and just run through the, the effects. And you know it was it was nice because all of my code was pure and I could I could reason about it. But it was it was pretty just verbose. So I came up with a, a nicer API. And this is where I get into that like sequence of, of effects, the the log of effects kind of thing. Um, so. Here, the first thing we do is we declare the expected effects that are going to be performed in like when I run this function, right? Um, and it's a it's a list of two tuples. So we have the the first element in each tuple is the intent that we expect, um, and so this is where the equality of your intents is important because equality is used to match um, uh, the intents. So uh, first thing we expect is a prompt, and the second item in each tuple is a function that simulates the, the performance or simulates the return value of that effect. Um, and so we're going to simulate that whenever we get prompted to enter your name, I'm going to return radix, and then, um, and then so on. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to note how the, the data flows through this, which I thought was really neat. It's like reflected very well in this. So like if you, if you simulate returning radix in the first effect, the second effect is going to use that result in, in what, you know, in the next intent or the next effect that it performs. Um, so I think that's, that's just uh, kind of a nice reflection of, of the way that the, the data flows through your code. Um, finally, once we have the expected sequence, uh, we perform it with perform sequence, uh, which is another interpreter, you know, just like sync perform was. Actually, it's implemented in, uh, on top of sync perform. It's kind of just a utility function. And it just builds a dispatcher based on that sequence um, that, that we've declared. Uh, and then finally, it, it returns the, oh wow, that doesn't look like it should. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, and then it finally returns the, the ultimate result, um, and you know, we assert against it. Not too bad. OK, um, so one of the things that I'm really proud of in this API is uh, when, you, when you have a bug, when something doesn't match up, it gives you this really nice descriptive error message of what just happened. Um, so, uh, here we, it's, it's not that important, but it's, it's something that, you know, uh, gives it a, a, like, a nice amount of polish to using the library. So um, this log is like, okay, uh, we tried to get a, or we expected, or we got a, a, an effect that said greets ace, and we couldn't find it. And so it's saying um, each, each line prefixed with sequence is like, here's an intent that I found and I performed, and it was, you know, it was correct. And then the not found line is like, here's what I tried to run, and I couldn't find it. It wasn't in your sequence. But the next expected thing was this. And you know, I just inserted a bug here. I misspelled um, greets with some, some higher bytes. Uh, so yeah, th this, this helps a lot when you're debugging effects. Um, and yeah, I think it's Im important to have this kind of stuff. OK, so that's it. That's everything that's the core part of the effect library. If that's all you, you know, if you like want to use effect, you know, that should be enough to get you going. If you want to re-implement it in another language, that should be enough. Um, I'm going to talk about a few other points just like uh, briefly um, in some things that I kind of figured out about effect after I used it in production for a while. And then I'm going to move on to the Haskell things. Um, 
So one of the first things I did was, well, actually, did anybody here know what Twisted is uh, for Python? OK, there's a decent amount of people. Um, I, I like, I've been working on Twisted since, like, I don't know, 2001 or something like that. And you know, we use it in the application that I work, uh, work on at Rackspace. Um, and so we needed, so, uh, like, it, I, I found myself doing a lot of uh, coordination between effects and Twisted. Um, and so I wanted to write a library that kind of made that easy. Uh, so Twisted has these things called deferreds, which are very similar to promises, if you know what that means. Um, they're a representation of an asynchronous result. It's a result that you don't have yet. Um, and that is pretty similar to effects. Like they have an API where you add a callback to them, and your callback will get called when, um, when the result is available. So effect is, is pretty similar. The, the difference is that deferreds are, uh, are mutable. Whenever you add a callback, it actually mutates the, the deferred you're adding it to, um, and effect gives you a new effect whenever you add a callback. Um, and so yeah, I, I just wrote a, a nice library. It, it gives you some performers, uh, some asynchronous performers for, for a lot of the intents. And it's in this uh, library called TX effect. So if you're interested in that. Um, another kind of neat thing uh, is I defined a parallel effects intent, um, which uh, you give it, you basically give it a list of effects. And it's saying, OK, I intend these to be run in parallel. Right, and there are multiple ways to run stuff in parallel. Right, like you can use thread, you can be asynchronous. Um, so there's a built-in performer in effect that uses threads for the parallel effects. So you can, you know, use requests library or whatever to, you know, just like and, and wrap them up in effects and and uh, and run them in parallel with threads. Or if you're using TX effect, you can use the twisted um, client uh, web client and and do that. And your application code stays the same. Uh, but you know you can use it in either environment, so it's it's really nice for libraries. Like if you want to write a library that's kind of generic between a bunch of like uh, that's agnostic to the decisions that the deployers will make, it, it's pretty valuable. Um, so the tests are also, yeah, I guess it's not as bad this time. Um, kind of uh, uh, agnostic to that. So there, here we're using uh, it's another like sequence of effects followed by a perform sequence thing. We're using a little utility function here that's basically saying, I expect, whenever I'm testing this code, I expect there to be a, a get to Google and a get to Yahoo, and those are going to be the results. And it's, it's ensuring that they're run in parallel. Um, right? And this is all without actually performing anything. So it's, it's pretty, pretty handy. Um, that's not The parallel seek function is not yet in the effect library. It's in my work code base, but I'm going to be migrating it there probably within a week. Um, <clears throat> okay, one kind of last interesting point is that, so I, I often find myself um, kind of abstracting over effects with more effects. Um, so an example of that is, uh, so like say I want to create a cloud server, like a Rackspace cloud server, and I have this function, create cloud server. Um, I might, uh, you know, implement that in terms of a make HTTP request uh, uh, function um, that, you know, uh, does the kind of low-level HTTP to, to, to you know, I want to post something to the Rackspace API, like to the server's endpoint and, and create something. Um, if that's implemented, you know, that might be implemented in a very low-level, or in terms of a very low-level intent, like write bytes to network, right? Um, you know, so it's like connect to this socket and write exactly these bytes, right? Like that's, that's super low-level. Um, if we do that, the tests end up being pretty ugly. You know, you, you're, you're trying to test this, like, create cloud server function, which is like way up here in terms of abstraction, but your tests are like, oh, what are the bytes on the network? That's not what we actually want to test. And so what I end up doing is um, creating a kind of more abstract intent, like for example, HTTP request, uh, which represents, you know, it takes a, a method and a URL and some, you know, parameters or whatever, and it's just saying like, I expect there to be an HTTP request made. Um, and so that way, you know, if you're using that, uh, in, in your make HTTP request function, then your tests are a little bit higher level. Uh, you can even go f further than that and like make an intent for each kind of API operation you want to do, like create cloud server, um, which you know further makes uh, it, it further makes your tests nice, and it also um, you know gives you more opportunity for modularity. So if you want to like swap out the performers, like swap out the a way that create cloud server is implemented. Um, you know, in terms of different things. And basically, whenever you do one of these abstractions, you just write a performer for the intent, like create cloud server, that returns another effect. And so it, you're still getting, you're, you're basically getting the stack of effects. Um, it, and yeah, it, it, it works out pretty nicely. 
Um, so one last uh, point about effects is that you shouldn't use them um, if you don't need to. Uh, so just like you want to avoid implicit side effects, it's also good to avoid explicit side effects. Um, even if you are tracking them, even there, if they are pure objects, they're still more, more complex than you know, simple data, simple data structures. Um, you know, it, it effects encode behavior, not just, not just data, right? They're, they have this intent, which is just data, but then they also have a callback or, or some callbacks. And, you know, you have to, once you have that, you need to, like, do more work to, to test them. You need to use this API that I made. And even though it's nice, it's still, like, it's, it's more complex than, like, is A equal to B, right? Um, so, yeah, I have some... I don't really have uh, enough time to go into the lessons I learned specifically around this in my in my work application. But you know, if you want to catch me at lunch or whatever, I can I can tell you. But yeah, just you know, keep that in mind. Don't don't like go overboard. You know, like oh, just because this is pure now, I can just use it everywhere. Like you still want to kind of isolate them. So um, now onto the Haskell stuff. That's all the Python stuff. I know this is like there's probably not a lot of people who who are that intersectional with like Python and Haskell, but I like them both, so I'm giving a talk about both. Um, so if you looked at the talk description, you see that I mentioned that I would have interesting Haskell content. I'll describe some ideas and techniques that even most Haskellers could use to make their code more easy, easily testable. Oh, boy. Um, so I was struggling with some of the type stuff <laughs> when I was working on this port of, of my code to, to Haskell. And I was under pressure with the deadline. And so I did what you do. Uh, I posted to Stack Overflow, and thankfully a day later, uh, uh, one of the prolific Stack Overflowers um, named Sirdek really saved me. He, he gave me a, a solution to um, the, the, the type problem that I was having. So thanks, Sirdek. Um, so free monads. Anyone ever heard the phrase free monad? Okay. Yeah, all right. So there are some people who read some Haskell blogs here. Um, they're getting pretty, pretty popular, especially among bloggers on, <laughs> in the Haskell world. Um, so basically, they're pretty simple. Uh, if you know what a monad is, they're basically they just, they're a data structure that, that represents monads in the simplest way you can with no extra stuff. So all they do is they record, like it's just a data structure that has, the, um, has kind of a, an intent. Um, that's not what it's usually called in... Uh, in the, in the literature, but you know, it's basically some some object in a DSL or something, um, and uh, and the other thing that it records is the the function that you've bound to it. So that's it. It's just like effect. Um, uh, there's a couple of um, libraries that implement this idea. You can also, I mean, it's it's a few lines of code to kind of implement it from scratch, but these libraries give you kind of a nice. Some, some attended functions that are, that are useful. Um, free is the basic one. Uh, you just basically define a little data structure of your, your um, DSL, is what they, or AS, or, or abstract syntax tree, whatever you want to call it, and then you wrap it around free, or wrap, wrap free around it, and it gives you the, the monad. Um, operational is another one. I slightly prefer it. It just lets you define the DSL in a slightly nicer way. Um, it doesn't really matter what you use. You can do this stuff uh, with both of them. So here is uh, the, the intent thing, the, the, the DSL that I called intent because it's really the same as before. Um, there are two, two of them, uh, two, two constructors for this type. Um, prompt, which takes a string to prompt the user with, and it results in a string. Um, display takes a string and results in nothing. It results in unit because display doesn't have a return value. Um, so we take this, this type, we wrap it with program, uh, which is from the operational library, uh, and it just gives you a free monad back. So my effect of A is a program that, when run, results in A. Uh, and then after that, we just kind of lift the, the um, constructors up into the, to the monad with these, the singleton function, which is also from operational. It, if you're familiar with free, it's called liftf there. Um, so yeah, that, this is equivalent to everything else in my Python implementation. Like, it's all here on this slide. Granted, using the free monad uh, library like saved me a lot of, of stuff. So, but yeah, Haskell's pretty nice, isn't it? Um, and here's the program. Uh, it's exactly the same as the Python version I, I showed you. It's prompting for uh, a name, printing out a greeting, prompting for another name, printing out another greeting, and returning the, the two, two names. Um, it's pretty, pretty readable, I think. Um, and here's the test for it. And this is where Sirdek helped me. Helped me. 
Um, it's, it's, uh, it's very similar to that perform sequence thing I was showing you. It's, it's, it's laying out the effects to be run in the specific order. Um, and it, basically what it's doing is it's building up an interpreter uh, that specifically, uh, that expects a specific sequence of, of instructions. Um, and it, this interpreter is custom crafted for that exact program. Um, I'm not super happy with this formulation because you see like there's check prompt, check display, there's these specific functions for each kind of intent. And like if you write a, you know, I have a lot of intents in my, in my work system. I don't want to write these little functions. So I'm sure there's a way to do, to like make this polymorphic. I just haven't figured it out yet. Um, so yeah. Here's an example of check prompt. Um, so it's, it might look a little complex, but it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, highlighted some of the interesting things. So check prompt, check prompt takes um, the expected prompt, like the, you know, enter your name. Uh, it takes the response that you want to simulate, so radix, and um, the program, so that's like the effect. Um, and it pattern matches on the program using the view function, which is from operational. It's basically just, you know, give me the kind of the head of this program. And if the first instruction or the next instruction in the program is a prompt, and that prompt uh, string matches, you know, is equal to what we expect, then we're going to continue. Uh, and we're going to continue with the simulated response. That's the cont response. Um, the cont is what's bound to the, uh, to the, um, to the instruction, like the, with the bind operator. So um, yeah, it, it's, there's also check display and check return, which are very similar. Um, so they, they just check the different kinds of effects you can have. Uh, like I said, it's, it's really like, I'm sure that I could abstract this and make this smaller and more polymorphic so that there's only one check function. I just <laughs> need to learn more Haskell. Um, so yeah, if anybody can help me with that, that would be great. <laughs> um, one last point, uh, free monads, like, you know, if, you've, if you're like on uh, any of the mailing lists or Reddit, like you've probably seen Edward Komet talking about how free monads are slow. And you know, like if you just use uh, a direct like implementation, it's faster. Um, you don't have to worry about that too much because at least one of the ways you can, you can deal with that is um, you can, make it so that in production, your code is just using IO, right? Like, so what you would do is, one, one example of what you could do is put the prompt and display function in a type class, make an instance of that type class for IO that just does the stuff directly. And then in testing, you make an instance of it for your free monad, and in your tests, you're like, okay, uh, interpret this program as a free monad, or run this, you know, run this function as, a, uh, an, uh, as type of my, the free mode that I, monad that I care about, and you get this data structure back instead of just performing it directly. Um, so this is a way you can over, uh, avoid that overhead in production. Um, this is probably nitty gritty, but you know, if you're super paranoid about uh, the performance, then it can be useful. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, you know, uh, isolate your side effects. Um, it's, it's really nice. It makes, it makes it more testable, more modular. You get to stop using the mock module. <laughs> so that's it, thank you. So I think I have time for questions, um, if anybody has any. Um, so I have, uh, in my app, we use uh, Cassandra. Uh, sorry, yes, how do I handle uh, database effects? Um, so we use Cassandra in, my, in the app at work. Um, we have an intent called execute CQL, uh, which, you know, it's the, the Cassandra query language. Um, and so you know, whenever we have a function that wants to do some database stuff, we, you know, just use that perform sequence thing and it's like, okay, well, I expect this query and this query and this query as side effects when I run this, this function. Um, and then we also have, uh, in some cases, you know, I was talking about abstracting effects. Um, because ex uh, execute CQL, CQL can get a little bit tedious if you're working in higher level, level application code and you're, you want to test some higher level function, we also have a few intents that abstract over that, the, like, you know, some stuff that's specific to our domain, like uh, create scaling group or whatever. It's, a, it's an auto scaling system. Um, so scaling group is one of the model objects in our system. We have a, an intent called create scaling group. Um, and so, you know, if, if we're doing that a lot, then we'll do that. We'll make that abstraction and then test in terms of that. So, does that answer? Okay. Any others? What if you want to sneak in a generator? It also has a what effect? It also has a control effect. Um, uh, I, have three 
I, I'm not, I don't think I quite follow it. Uh, you know, generate, like, so one of the... The challenge is to get out of composed, worn-out view but it's all about now your wall. Right, yes, yeah, you cannot compose monads. Right, so um, there's only one monad here. That's the way I get around it. <laughs> like, there's only, this is essentially only the IO monad. Um, and so, you know, there is no pure, like, state monad or whatever in this system. So it, it works out so that I don't have um, uh, the problems of, of composition of monads because I only have one. And, you know, at the expense of not having more specific monads that have specific behavior. Also, it's only sequential, right? Like, you. You could write interpreters for effects that do different things, but like in practice, you know, you can't implement the list monad in terms of effect because you can't jump backwards uh, in 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 the um, in the generator in Python. So, yeah. Any others? Yep. Does, does this imply that this approach is useful only if you don't need to make decisions on what to do next after you get data back from some special operation? Yeah, so the question is. Um, does this only apply when you don't need previous data uh, to determine what your next steps are? No, it, it works for that. Um, you, you, it, just, like, that's actually the power of monad over applicative, if you're familiar with Haskell. Like, so applicative, you can't use previous data to make decisions about what you're gonna do next. In monads, you can. So, um, and this is very similar to a monad. So uh, you, you, you get the data, you get the result of the previous effect. And remember how I was showing like how um, in that one example, like I was simulating radix being returned from uh, the, the first prompt, and the second display, the display had radix in it. So it was using that. And I could have put a conditional in there to say, if it's radix, do this effect. If it's this, do that effect. And that's actually where that sequential testing API like really shines. Because you know, what you'll do is you'll write a few different tests for the same code, passing in different data that, that makes it take different code paths, and you'll just see that, like, okay, this code path results in this series of effects, that code path results in that series of effects. So it's, 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 pretty, uh, it's pretty powerful. So, so you end up with a case where essentially you're in, everything you're doing is within the uh, operation of interpreting the intent, but you have, you know, some. Uh, so, yeah, uh, the question is, Yeah, so, so the question is, like, do you end up where most of your code, like most of your stack is running inside of the performance system of you know, performing intents, which return more effect, uh, intents and, and so on? And, and yeah, like a, a lot of times that does happen. And it's, you know, it's, it, uh, you want to, you still, you know, like I said, you kind of want to minimize the, the amount of effects that you have. But, you know, generally they, they are at the top, right? It's kind of like uh, if you've ever heard Gary Bernhardt talk about, um, functional core imperative shell, like the, the, the shell is kind of like your main function, right? And that's imperative, that's using effects. And then you have little bits of, of pure functions inside. Um, so yeah, like uh, if you get a trace back out of something, you're gonna see effect stuff in there. You're gonna see a perform, you know, and then, uh, you know, whatever performer was happening. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's true. Um, any others? See any? Okay, well that's it. Thank you very much.